is there a dimension, an element to this that we can learn something from, that we can extract for our own daily lives. So to do that, I'll outline a general history of, of Irish mythology to give us a, a broad overview and then take some specific examples uh, to, to focus on some of the, the, the symbols uh, in Irish mythology that, that we can learn something from and hopefully see if we can extract some, some lessons, uh, teachings from those symbols and myths that we can maybe inspire ourselves with, perhaps apply in our own lives every day. So what we'll look at, um, Irish mythology is comprised of four cycles. So we'll touch on the four mythological cycles uh, briefly, expanding from that then on the, the Tue de Danon, which is the uh, pantheon of, of Irish gods. Uh, there's a lot of ancient Irish concepts and terms that I'll be using. I apologize in advance for the pronunciation. Uh, I think more or less accurate, but I can't uh, attest to some of them. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the Tua de Danon, and then also at the end a little bit about uh, easily the most famous of Irish heroes, Cú Cullen. So to begin then, what is mythology? Um, etymology can help here if we look at mythos, the word in Greek, mythos, which uh, means story. It can be translated as story of the people. So it's a story that is conveying the, the vision or the, the, the mentality of a people. Uh, we often today, I suppose, dismiss mythology as a myth. We even, even the way we use it in language, something is a myth, it's, it's a falsehood, it's fiction. Um, but the, the origin of mythos or mythology was a, a story that contained a universal truth. So it's not a literal truth. And that's sometimes what we have difficulty with because we prefer to have literal facts. But mythology is not about being factual. It's about expressing a, a symbolic, uh, timeless reality or truth that encompasses fundamental elements about the universe, about life and death uh, and the human condition. So if we understand the mythos, then if we understand the mythology of a people, it, it's an insight into the mentality of that people, that culture. Uh, how did they view life, death, the cosmos? What, what were their values and how did they express them in their imaginary? And the purpose of that then, uh, mythology has helped humanity for, for thousands of years to connect and reconnect with what is timeless to elevate our state of mind, our consciousness, and connect with something universal, to, to help us to, to rise above the, the, the everyday, the temporal, the, the constantly changing, so that we can gain a different perspective, uh, let's say a more elevated perspective, which helps us then to, to view things with a bit more clarity so that we can act differently. Uh, simply, we could say it's to inspire ourselves, because mythology can inspire us, but with that inspiration, what do we do with it? Ideally, we, we translate that inspiration into some kind of an action. What we've seen over the last you know, century or so, uh, a lot of work has been done, anthropologists, psychologists, uh, studying in great detail various myths, uh, figures like Joseph Campbell, uh, Mercia Eliad, uh, Carol Jung, have all done enormous research uh, to, to look into the importance of myth in culture, comparing and contrasting the different myths of different civilizations, uh, looking for the, the underlying universal thread of meaning, and then exploring the different expressions and their characteristics. What are the characteristics of Irish mythology then? We can observe uh, a lot of heroism, courage, uh, bravery in battle, loyalty, friendship is very important in Irish myths, honorability. Uh, there's also a strong through line of art and interestingly hospitality. One of the examples we, we'll touch on briefly is a cauldron that never runs empty. So that's to me a, a beautiful example of, of Irish uh, hospitality. I guess the modern equivalent is the kettle that never runs empty. But 
uh, it's something that has been there always in the Irish uh, psyche. What we can also see when we look at the evolution of Irish mythology is an undeniable Christian influence uh, from the medieval period around the uh, 10th, 11th century, uh, Christian monks working diligently to collect and uh, make a lot of copies of all of the myths of the land. Uh, invariably, over time, there were some embellishments where the Christian myth was kind of added a layer to Irish mythology so that the Christian story could be more accessible to people at the time. Whether that's good, bad, or indifferent, it's up to, up to each of us to decide for ourselves whether that's a good thing, but it was a, a natural thing that we see in most mythologies, they evolve, and, and cultures coming together, uh, they adapt. Um, but so it, it means when we observe Irish mythology, there, some of it is obscured slightly by this kind of Christian layer, uh, which we have to understand as well, just to, to see where these things are coming from. So, the different cycles then of, of Irish mythology, as I said, there are four. There's the mythological cycle, the Fenian cycle, the Ulster cycle, and the historical cycle. And to touch on each of those briefly, the mythological cycle uh, is where we will find most of the, the oldest stories uh, about the gods, the origins of the Irish people, um, the, the most fo famous or notable examples, probably things like uh, the Children of Lear, um, the Dream of Angus, the Wooing of Etienne. But what we'll focus on in a little bit more detail later is the Ka Matura and the Labor Gabala Aaron, which are ancient sources that talk about different battles that. A tri uh, contributed to the formation of Ireland. Then we have the Fenian cycle, uh, which uh, refers mostly to the mythical hero Fionn McCool and his warriors, his band of warriors, the Fina, who were a, a band of, of mercenaries and hunters uh, that had a number of different adventures. Uh, from this period, many people might be familiar with the Salmon of Knowledge uh, is a story that comes from the Fenian cycle. The Ulster Cycle uh, describes the, the legends and the heroes of Uled, which was Eastern, a kingdom of Eastern Ulster and, and Northern Leinster. These are attributed largely to manuscripts that emerged from the medieval period, so there's a lot of the Christian influence at this phase. And easily the most important story that emerges from the Ulster Cycle is the Ton Bo Cúlnia or the Cattle Raid of Cooley. And this is the, the famous um, epic, I suppose, uh, which was a war between, uh, between Ulster and Connacht. The Queen of Connacht, Queen Maeve, waging war against Ulster. It's probably one of the most famous aspects of Irish mythology and, and largely because the central figure is Cúchulainn, that uh, hero that I mentioned. Then for the historical cycle, we're moving closer towards uh, contemporary history. What, what we see in the historical cycle is the, during the medieval period in Ireland, uh, the professional poets or bards uh, employed by various families, the, the nobility, the, the kings of the, of the time, uh, they were applying their trade to construct the stories of the families, the kings, creating the history of the time, and rather poetically, and so, sometimes taking a bit of license and, and weaving in mythological elements to the stories that they were telling. So the historical cycle has much more historical basis. There, there's factual things that uh, you know, we have much more records of having occurred, but there's still a, an element of, of legend that's kind of woven into those by the, the poets that, that recorded the stories. Uh, so figures like uh, the High Kings of Ireland, uh, Brian Boru, and so on, would have uh, been recorded from the historical cycle. To, to focus then for a little bit on the mythological cycle, uh, what, what's the very strong through line in the mythological cycle is this concept of invasions. 
uh, the, the whole basis of this period was waves or, or cycles of invaders coming and settling in Ireland. And when we look in general at mythology in, in varieties of, of different cultures, there's always an origin myth of some kind. It can be a cosmological myth or a sociological myth. And cosmological would focus more on the origins of the world, of, of the universe, uh, a creation myth of some kind. Sociological then is about the people. It's the basis of the foundation of the civilization. Uh, so as another example outside of Ireland, Romulus and Ramus would be the, the, the founding myth of, of Rome, for example. With the Irish mythological cycle, we see mostly a sociological uh, element, talking about the, the settling of people, the, the, the battles and, and so on that, that uh, formed the country, while of course there's also a relationship with the gods and goddesses, so there's also an element of, of the creation myths in there as well. One of the main uh, sources that we have uh, depicting all of these events is that text that I mentioned, the Labor Gabala Aaron, which is literally the book of the taking of Ireland, or uh, what's more commonly known as the book of invasions. And so that is a collection of poems and uh, prose narratives written in Irish, which is uh, accounting for the history of Ireland from the creation of the world up to the medieval period. Uh, there's a number of versions of the text that have emerged over time, the earliest uh, of which is attributed to an anonymous writer from the 11th century, uh, quite possibly one of these Christian monks or scribes that was collating all of these stories, taking together and, and synthesizing many different narrative threads that had been uh, building up over the previous centuries. And then the, the story of the text is talking about Ireland being settled or taken by six different groups. Uh, the original settlers of Ireland were called the Fomorians. And they were a, an elemental race of beings. And they remained throughout, though other people came and settled as well. Uh, next was the, the people of Partholone or Muinter Partholone, and then the Nemedians the next people who came. The Nemedians were oppressed by the Fomorians and eventually scattered. They fled the island and the remnants of the Nemedians split into two other tribes who wandered around Europe, the Firbolg and the Tuadedanan. The Firbolg eventually returned and were able to settle the island again. Later, the Tuadedanan came, displaced the Firbolg, and then finally, the Milesians, the sixth group, came and settled in Ireland. The Milesians representing the Gaels or the Irish, the Irish people who came and settled. So mo most of the previous uh, generations of settlers eventually were removed or wiped out. The Tuadedanan then became the, uh, the gods, the pantheon of, of gods of ancient Ireland, and the Milesians, the, the Irish settlers. Uh, who finally populated the island. That's a very synthetic overview of the, the waves of invasions, but it shows uh, an initial relationship between these different groups, which we'll uh, expand on a little bit. When we're talking about the Tuadedanan, uh, it's also interesting to zoom out a little bit from Ireland and take in the wider Celtic context across Europe, as the Tuadedanan, uh, as a pantheon of, of divinities, share a lot of connections with other gods in other European countries through this network of the Celtic civilization. And the Celts themselves are uh, an offshoot of the Indo-European people, uh, which is quite interesting because the Indo-European people uh, are a very, very old kind of root of humanity that had a, a common linguistic and cultural background, but spread all around Asia and Europe. This language, this Proto-Indo-European language, which doesn't exist anymore, but was dated back to about 4,000 BC, so over 6,000 years ago, became the basis of what would evolve into all the different languages that Hellenic, uh, Italic, Sanskrit, uh, Celtic, and Germanic, just to name a few examples. 
So linguistically and symbolically, it's quite interesting to see that there's a lot in common between the Celts and Hindu tradition. Uh, so Irish gods uh, appear or appear very similarly in Hindu tradition. And I, I mentioned this in relation to Tua De Danon because the Tua De Danon refers to the people or the tribe of Danu, the goddess Danu. And there is a, a version of Danu that appears in Hinduism. Across Celtic Europe, Danu was Danuvius, and that after Danuvius is where the name Danube came for the river Danube. So Danu, uh, for the Irish as well, was symbolic of the waters of life, uh, a life-giving river, and it's from those waters uh, that the Tua De Danon emerge, the waters of life. He's the children of, of Danu. And then the myth goes on to explain that the, the Tua De Danon arrive in Ireland on a ship. They land at Schlieveneren, or the Iron Mountain, which is in County Leitrim. And from there, they enter into conflict with the Firbolg, who remained as the, the, the most recent settlers of, of the island. In the accounts of the, the Ka Matura, or the, the Battle of Matura, the first Battle of Matura is where the Firbolg are overthrown, the Tue de Danon settle in Ireland, and then they're confronted with the Fomorians, that original uh, race that occupied Ireland. And the Fomorians, as I mentioned, have a, an elemental association. They, they re represented the, the, the harmful or more destructive aspects of nature, uh, darkness, blight, flood, they were personifications of chaos. And so it's from chaos then that the Tue de Danon uh, fight to bring order. And where the attributes of the, the Fomorians are, are chaotic, the attributes of the Tue de Danon are uh, language, uh, art, crafts, culture, civilization. And this is a very interesting dynamic that we can also identify in other cultures a similar dichotomy between, in Greece, for example, the Titans and the gods of Olympus, uh, in Norse mythology, the Jotnar and the Aesir. So this idea of the Tue de Danon coming and civilizing Ireland, or cosmos, order, emerging from chaos, is something that mythologically is, is very common in, in different cultures. After that, arrived the Milesians, who are, who are the Gaels, uh, the Irish people that come and displace or depose the Tua De Danum. And the old gods then retreat into what's called the other world or uh, the Shi, which is uh, an invisible dimension or realm that the gods inhabit, sometimes associated with the mythical land of Tirnanog, the land of eternal youth. And over time, then the the, the attributes and the figures of, of the gods uh, became more related with the fairies of, of later Irish folklore. It's interesting to see the, the different associations that the Tua De Danon have, the different gods in the pantheon uh, related with different attributes, uh, different aspects of nature, something again that we see very common in pantheons of gods, where the gods encompass different aspects, sometimes contradictory elements. There's a duality in the gods as they were understood as representations of life, of nature. And so they, they incorporate the duality of life, which is why we see in a lot of gods uh, representations of light and dark, life and death, uh, creation and destruction. Again, our, our analytical tendency has difficulty to understand that because we look at things as one or the other. But in the, in the older perspective, the traditional perspective of these things, there's a, a simultaneity that the gods can represent uh, multiple things at the same time. Within the, the Tua De Danon pantheon, just to give some examples, uh, I'll use three uh, brothers to, to focus on. The three gods of skills, or the three De Dana, and it's something that again, appears a lot in, in Celtic culture, but in, in many traditions, uh, some kind of tripartite divinity 
or a sacred trinity, something that is in Christianity as well in many religions, but most traditions have expressed this in one way or another. It's also worth mentioning for the Irish example, the three sister goddesses, Eriu, Banba, and Fodla, the first of whom, Eriu, is where the name of Ireland comes from, Era. So the three gods of skills are Dagda, Ogma, and Lu. Dagda, or the good god, uh, also known as Al Ahar, or All Father, which is something that equates also to, to Odin in Norse mythology. Dagda is described as uh, possessing a magic staff, which kills with one end and brings life with the other. Uh, he was the one who possessed the cauldron, which never runs empty, and a magic harp, which can control the emotions of men and change the seasons. He was believed to, to dwell in Brunebonia, or Newgrange, as it's more commonly known. Uh, Ogma was a warrior and a scholar, uh, attributed with creating language. So that's where the word Om comes from, Om script. He created writing, so again, this civilizing cultural element uh, would, would make him an equivalent to Toth in Egypt or Hermes in Greece. And Lu, uh, Lu of the long hand, uh, was one of his names. Uh, the long hand is an interesting symbol which was represented with kingship, um, that his, his reach was very far. And, and so this was a symbol of kingship that uh, the king's reach, as far as their kingdom was, that was their uh, reach of responsibility. Uh, one of the myths around Lu was that he turned himself into a fly and was drank in a, in a glass of wine by Dectir, who was a, a queen or a princess. And she then became with child, and that child was Satanta, who would be the boy that grows up to be Kukulun. So that segues to our hero myth, which is another fascinating aspect of mythology, something that, again, a lot of research has been done. Joseph Campbell, probably one of the most uh, prominent figures in that work, and he did a huge amount in mapping out the, the, the universal journey of the hero, which we can see as a symbolic journey of the human being, our journey of the awakening and development of, of consciousness. What is a hero? A hero tends to be uh, categorized as the progeny of a, a god and a mortal, like in the example of Satanta, Lu, and Dectir. So there is a divine aspect and uh, uh, a mortal aspect. And this becomes a symbol of the human being because we have a, a human nature, we have a flawed nature, but there is also something timeless in us, something uh, divine that we aspire to. And so the hero is that model of self-conquest, of awakening that uh, divine aspect. Kukulin, as an example of this, is a very interesting figure. Um, his own story is, is very detailed, but perhaps too much for, for our occasion here. What I think is more interesting for, for what I'm trying to share is the story of Satanta, uh, which is Kukulin before he becomes Kukulin. And even that to me is quite interesting that he doesn't start out a hero, he becomes one. And it's through the, through the journey of Satanta that we can understand that becoming or awakening of the hero. The story of Satanta uh, is that as a young boy, about the age of seven, he's invited to attend a feast at the manor of Cullen, a local lord and blacksmith. And he's on his way to the feast, but he's late because he was playing hurling with his friends. And he still has with him the hurley and, and the ball or the schlitter, for those who know hurling a little bit. He's on his way to, to the manor, but he's late, and the guard dog, or the hound of Cullen, has already been released. And so the dog finds and sets upon Kukul, uh, Satanta, the boy, and this ferocious wolfhound is about to devour him. Even though he's terrified, young Satanta has the wherewithal to be able to quickly react, and with great accuracy, he knocks the Schlitter back down the throat of the hound, and kills him, saving himself. When Cullen comes out of the manor and sees that his, his hound has been killed, he's devastated. 
But Setanta steps forward and says, until you can raise another hound to take over, I will be your hound. I will be guardian of these lands. And so he becomes the hound of Cullen or Ku Cullen. We can interpret this in many different ways, but if we look at the, the universality of, of what's expressed through the heroic myth, we can extract a number of key interpretations uh, suggesting that this tale is telling us about the emergence of the hero. Uh, or another way of looking at it is the, the maturation of the human being from childhood into adulthood. Not just physically, but, but psychologically, emotionally. So a few ways to, to look at that. The first, the first stage in the myth of this story is that Satanta faces his fears. Uh, confronted by the hound, terrified, he's still able to act. Uh, despite the danger, he's able to use what's at his disposal, which is just the Hurley and the Schlitter. And that, there's a great heroic element in that because often in, in facing our fears and facing challenges in life, we want uh, to be perfect. We want everything to already line up so that the solution is there. But in this act of facing his fears and, and working with what he has, Satanta is demonstrating that we already have qualities. We already have tools that we can use. We, we can't wait to be perfect to face our fears. And so he accepts to engage in the inner battle, which is kind of the second stage. Because the hound itself is representative of our lower nature, our animal instincts. And so it's an inner battle that's being represented. Like uh, in Greek mythology, the Minotaur in the center of the labyrinth that Theseus goes to face. It's a, an aspect of the human being that, that can be mastered, conquered. In the story, it's, it's represented as something that's slain. But again, that's not a literal uh, concept. We can't kill our instincts, but we can master them. We can, we can overcome them so that we live more consciously. And so that inner battle is something that we face every day to overcome our limitations, our defects, our instinctive nature. But that hound is a part of us. Our, our instincts are, are natural. It's, it's not a disease, but it's something that we can overcome and integrate so that we can become who we are, which is the third stage then where Satanta has overcome the hound and then he claims his destiny. He steps in and takes responsibility because he has mastered himself, he has mastered his fears, and now he can become a hero. And he earns a new name and uh, becomes the, the infamous Ku Cullen. And what's interesting there is when he takes responsibility for himself, he is then able to be at the service of others, protecting the land. So that's one example, but it's a, it's an, a classical Irish example, and it's fascinating to me how the, 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 the way we can understand the symbolism of that journey of the awakening of the hero, something that we can all uh, inspire ourselves with and contend with every day, because we all have that hound, that uh, instinctive nature that poses certain limitations, which we can engage with and overcome so that we can become ourselves, more authentically us. That's some of the elements that I wanted to share. Um, mythology has, has demonstrated itself as, as giving us access to the ancient root of, of humanity. It portrays timeless ideas and ways of understanding the human condition, uh, our weaknesses, but also the best in us, whether activated or simply in potential. Uh, the Irish gods and, and all the gods of mythology they demonstrate principles of life, uh, laws of nature to help us understand the universe. And heroes provide a template uh, for our own evolution, uh, overcoming that lower nature so that we can strive for the divine or the conscious. So mythology is, is an incredible way to, to connect with our roots and also to aspire to, to live in a way that is, in a way I would say more mythologically, and that's not to say in fantasy, but that we inspire ourselves to aspire to the highest in us so that we can bring meaning to the experiences of our lives.